Welcome to Your City Connections, where you get to meet entertaining and informative guests. Guests such as an artist with a brush, or with a camera, and guests with a violin. City Connections, providing insightful interviews with favorite son, Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb. To City Commissioners, the Mayor. Interviews with a rodeo queen, to beauty queen, and even a NBA player. Now, join Steve Keim as he discusses another engaging topic on City Connections. Hello and welcome to City Connections. I'm Steve Keim. Thank you for joining me. And I know you, you may get tired of me saying this every week, but I tell you what, I have the best guest. We are so fortunate at the Enid Television Network to have uh, different individuals from across the state that have an Enid connection. They come back each uh, week to just kind of keep us caught up. And let me just kind of give you a brief bio. We could spend 20 minutes on what this gentleman has done, but I want to just give you a snapshot. Uh, he was governor of Oklahoma from 1995 to 2002, uh, moved to Tulsa. Uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, where he's born. He's a, you know, a commando, as in Cashel Hall commando. If you live in Tulsa, you're familiar with that. Georgetown University graduate and also went to law school at the University of Oklahoma, served with the FBI, also served with the House of Representatives in Oklahoma, also the State Senate, served as Assistant Secretary. Are you, are you getting this uh, bio? I mean, it's rather impressive. And he also served as Associate U.S. Attorney and I think most of us will really relate to this, that he received national recognition for leading the state's recovery efforts, if you recall, from the bombing of the Murrah building and how the state was put on the map. And this gentleman was uh, a key part of that recognition by being so articulate of conveying the message or the Oklahoma message. He was also inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 2005. And with all of that, he was kind enough to come to Enid, Oklahoma today to visit with me here at the ETN studios. And it's my special pleasure to introduce Governor Frank Keating. Steve, a pleasure. Nice to hey, see you again. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Welcome to Enid. Well, right off the bat, with the presidential race that's going on, you know, politics looks pretty tough with all the verbal abuse and things that goes on. So my first question to you is, why in the world did you want to be governor of Oklahoma? Well, T Doug, Doug France, the former mayor, is sitting in the studio as we speak. Those of us who have had the honor and the opportunity to serve in public life, my grandfather was a Democrat member of Congress one term and didn't run again. During okay. the Depression was insistent that there be a banker on the banking committee. <laughs> I think that's our obligation as citizens to serve, whether it's the school board or sure. the legislature or whatever it may be. I really love being governor. I think we accomplished a lot in a bipartisan way together. But would I do it over again? I'm glad there's a two-term <laughs> limit. <laughs> well, let's, we'll talk about some of your accomplishments uh, specifically throughout our interview today. And speaking of achievements, let's, as two-term governor, let's, let's go to the first term only. Um, what do you consider the, the significant achievement or achievements in that first term? Well, you remember several years ago, um, one of the presidential candidates, who was then a U.S. senator, was asked, what do you think the most significant three things you accomplished during your 20-plus year mm -hmm. in the U.S. Senate? And it was like a deer in the headlights. He didn't know <laughs> what to say because he votes on stuff. Well, if you're an executive, you can point to things that happened. In the first term, obviously, uh, April 19, 1995, was a a day of horror and tragedy. Sure. In Oklahoma, 168 of our neighbors and friends murdered, um, hundreds injured. Um, we all wish that never had happened. <clears throat> but, you know, I had the, the honor of leading Oklahoma at that time. The mayor uh, in, of Oklahoma City, Ron Norick, and I became really both brothers in the bond. And we had superbly gifted officials in the emergency management arenas Gary Morris, the fire chief, mm -hmm. um, uh, the emergency management folks, the uh, police chief and the like. Um, and Oklahoma City and Oklahoma showed itself to be highly gifted, highly spiritual, highly uh, competent in a time of tragedy and crisis. And that had to be, for me, the most significant event of my okay. first term. But I'll tell you one thing, last year, the 20th anniversary of the bombing, all the senior officials from D.C., Secretary of Homeland Security, head of the FBI, head of the Secret Service were in town. Homeland Security Secretary said something to all of us that really startled me. We had panel discussions. 
He said, you know, over the last 20 plus years in the United States, no city and no state has been in charge of their natural or man-made disaster. We run it. We assign who's in charge. Oklahoma City was the only exception. We saw, because we knew Frank Keating, we also learned the mayor was a highly competent business guy, and the fire chief, Sam Gonzalez, the police chief, everybody was really very uh, organized and very professional, so we stepped back and let you guys run it. I wasn't aware of that. That's a great compliment to Oklahoma sure. and Oklahoma City. I appreciate you leading into this topic because it leads directly into my next question. Take us back to that morning of uh, April 19th. Is that right? I'm trying to remember. Right. April 19th, 1995. Um, that was three months. People may not realize this. You're sworn in in January, and then three months later, this, this blast, the bomb goes off. Can you take us back to where you were that morning and how were you aware of the... Uh, the, well, we had the, in the, Oklahoma City, and I'm a Tulsa guy mm -hmm. by uh, growing up and by schooling, but <clears throat> we had in Oklahoma City the Oklahoma City Mayor's Prayer Breakfast that morning. Down at the Civic Center, the Restaurant Association was down there at all, as well at, for their convention. So <clears throat> when it was over, I went back to the office and just started my work day. 9.03 was the time of the blast. And when the blast occurred, the windows of my office, and they're bulletproof windows of the governor's office, you could, it was a thump. You hmm. could feel the pressure against the side of the building, which showed you what a huge event it was. Immediately, um, one of the TV news um, helicopters was over the site, and somebody said, oh my gosh, it's a federal courthouse. I could see it was a federal office building, and it would be filled with people. It was, right. you know, early in the morning. But after the workday began, and then another person opined it's a natural gas explosion. Well, ATF was under me at one time, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and, I, and explosives. And I said, that's no natural gas event. Somebody blew that place up, and which is exactly what happened. So to coordinate that and to step back, especially for a political figure, to step back and say, okay, the FBI is going to handle the criminal investigation, the you know, emergency responders, National Guard, everybody's in line. I had just appointed the new National Guard commander. And everyone performed flawlessly. The Oklahoma Standard, really, today, even uh, the Department of Homeland Security talks about if you want to learn how to do bad, good things following a bad thing, uh, listen and learn from Oklahoma City. So it was a, I never saw a newspaper um, listen to TV or radio for two weeks because we were also very, very busy. And uh, it was just a horrific event to kill 19 children sure. as McVeigh did. It's just absolutely evil and inexcusable. Yeah. I have a question in regard to the Oklahoma Standard that I'll ask about later on in our interview. Uh, Governor, in my research for our visit today, I, I noticed in, in one of your interviews, and I'm sure you've done so many interviews, but you said, out of evil comes good. And I don't know if you recall that statement or not, but it was one of the statements that I saw uh, in some of the research for this visit today. Out of evil comes good. Can you kind of elaborate on that statement? Well, I mean, it, it really is basic Christianity. I mean, the death of Christ on the cross mm -hmm. was an evil event. Um, and out of that came Christianity. Uh, out of that came a religion of, of faith, and forgiveness and mercy and love. And that's, you know, the greatest good that is imaginable. <clears throat> the courage and the perseverance, remember, we didn't know it at the time, but after a very few short hours, we knew there was nobody living left. So it was a rescue mm -hmm. operation initially, but it was a recovery operation. So you had men firefighters and rescue workers crawling into that debris with a very fragile building. Remember April, obviously, in Oklahoma, the wind blows. Sure. It sure. could have collapsed to do what? Not to save anybody, but to recover bodies. Um, that was enormously significant. 302 buildings damaged or destroyed and not one act of looting. Um, the spirituality presented by the religious leaders in Oklahoma of all persuasions was enormously significant. So that was the good that I saw that came out of it. And, and quite truthfully, Oklahoma City is a transformed city. You know, the success of MAPS, MAPS 2, MAPS for Kids, 
Um, you know, I was able to raise the money privately to put the dome on the Capitol building as a statement that, you know, we would persevere, we would survive. Um, you know, I have two kids that, well, all th three of my children, one lives in Richmond, Virginia, but all of them grew up back east, truthfully went to school out of state, and two of the three live here in Oklahoma City or live in Oklahoma City. They love Oklahoma, they wouldn't live anyplace else. Uh, but Oklahoma City now is a young person's town. I can't say in 1995 that was the case. No. My special guest today on City Connections is former Governor Frank Keating. Do you just say former governor or do you always say governor? What's, what's, the, what's the right phrase? I need, I need to learn something. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> but I was laughing with some of your colleagues this morning. The, uh, uh, I read a book about one of the authors of the uh, Constitution or Declaration of Independence, and the author said, and he wasn't a very significant member, I guess, of this convention. <laughs> and he said, and he, and he lived, uh, he died as he had lived and passed from obscurity into oblivion. If you're an ex-governor, you have passed from obscurity into oblivion. I'm the former Frank Keating. But okay. I, I, I'm really thrilled that I had the opportunity to serve. It was a glorious eight years. Very good. Well, out of respect, I'm going to say Governor Frank Keating today is my special guest on City Connections. He's touched on the Murrah Building, talked about the Dome a little bit. And those are some of the topics that's coming up. So thank you for staying with us on City Connections. We'll have more with Governor Frank Keating in just a moment. Thank you for joining us again on City Connections. Appreciate you staying with me. My special guest today is Governor Frank Keating. He was gracious enough to leave OKC and come up to Enid to do some things today and stop by the ETN studio. Uh, Governor, you, you see the backdrop here. We, we, I really want to get to the story about some of these children's books that you've written, but for our audience, I just want them to know that that book cover that you see behind us, we'll, we'll get to that topic in just a moment because I, I want to learn more about your children's book. But speaking of, of children, you said something to me that we need to discuss a little bit about scholarships. And since we're on the topic of Murrah Building, can you share with us about uh, that topic? Well, you know, when a tragedy occurs, <clears throat> you want to rescue, recover. You don't think about raising money for a response and to help these people in the future who survived or whose families were killed. So we had the first contribution to the governor's fund came truthfully from the Muslim community of Oklahoma City. I think it was 30,000 bucks because I had said, somebody said, you know, this is a Middle Eastern terrorist event. Well, actually, McVeigh looked like me. And I said, well, I don't know who did it. We'll find out, but let's don't start a pogrom against a group unless mm -hmm. we know for a fact that sure. individuals did this terrible thing. Well, um, this check arrived, so we established uh, a fund. When the f fundraising ended, um, it, we probably had six or seven million dollars in there. Well, I made a battlefield decision that this was not a life insurance payment. So if you lost your kids, like the Smiths lost those two little mm -hmm. boys, we would provide you counseling and we would bury the children. On the other hand, if your kids lost you, and there were 30 children who lost both their parents, there were 170 kids that lost one of their parents, we used this money to put you through college the most expensive thing for anybody today. Sure. And I remember there was a time when I was governor, actually, we had a reception at the Phyllis Pavilion there at the governor's mansion that Kathy and I built. Um, and we had about 105 kids, young men and women, who were going to college. Um, probably that has been exhausted. Now we're focusing on health care for a lot of them were badly injured. Uh, it was handled, has been handled by the Oklahoma City Community Foundation. There's still money in that account, but every child who wanted to go to college, <clears throat> anywhere they wanted to go, uh, that was, the fund was used for that purpose. And I hope as a result, there are a lot of young people that will have a, a real opportunity in life without their mom, or without their mom and dad, mm -hmm. as a result of that scholarship fund. Governor, earlier in our visit, you talked about the Oklahoma Standard. And my wife and I were talking about that phrase here just recently. Can you kind of take us back to maybe where that, the Oklahoma standard, when did it start becoming a popular phrase? Was it during that time of the Murrow Building bombing? Well, Steve, or was it before? Yeah, I think so because I remember I used to say goodbye to the urban search and rescue uh, teams that came to help us. <clears throat> and I remember 
it was from Fairfax County, Virginia, I believe, was the team. And uh, this f firefighter had a uh, rescue worker and firefighter had a dollar bill in his hand. He said, hey, Governor, you know where this is? And I said, yeah, it's a dollar bill. I'm in politics. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I recognize money. And, and he said, no, this isn't any dollar. This is an Oklahoma dollar. It's a dollar that all of us came with. All of us will say mm -hmm. the same thing. We never spent a, set, a cent wherever we went in town to have dinner. We just had work clothes on. No one knew who, where, who we were, where we were from, but mm -hmm. they would listen, people in the restaurant, or they would ask, are you all part of the rescue team? And the check never came. They In New York, for example, we lost, uh, uh, Ray Downey was a, became a good friend of mine, deputy chief of the New York Fire Department, who was killed on 9-11, by the way. But the New York guy said, you know, when the World Trade Center was bombed in 93, two years before the Oak City event, uh, we had to pay $5 for a sack of ice. In Oklahoma City, laundry, clothing, boots, you know, any kind of doctor's help, in those days pre-cell phone, you know, long distance calls, everything was free, meals everywhere you went in town free. It was a remarkable. So competent response and generosity and goodness, that was the Oklahoma standard. In my corporate days, I used to fly a lot to the east and west coast, and this is several years back. But when people would find out that I was from Oklahoma, they would jokingly say, well, do you have running water in your state? <laughs> or, or uh, Steve, does John Wayne live there? And yeah. do you have a horse? You know, and just kind of cowboy and, and Indian stuff is what they would say. And of course, I don't know if they meant it as an insult, but over and over, I kept hearing people say, well, golly, do you really have plumbing in your state? They just had this Hollywood picture of Western, I guess, for Oklahoma. After the bombing, can you kind of share with us how the image of Oklahoma changed? Because you had well, a lot to no, do with I that. Mean, there was no doubt about it. I remember there were three of us that presented to the owners of the NBA about getting Seattle's team to Oklahoma City. There were three of us. One was the chairman of the chamber, one was the mayor of Oklahoma City, and one was I. My responsibility was to talk about the character, the soul, the spirit of Oklahoma. I was a dangling participle in the whole deal. But, I mean, the mayor was brilliant. The chamber <clears throat> CEO was brilliant. They had a light show that just wouldn't quit. Mm -hmm. But the owners were all transfixed by the story of no looting. What? And 302 buildings were damaged or destroyed. And the generosity, the goodness, the civic commitment and the pride. And it was Oklahoma. It wasn't. I mean, there were a lot of people from Enid that came to help after the Oak City bombing. So it was the Oklahoma standard, really, not just the Oklahoma City standard. And, you know, it made, we, made us as Oklahomans think, you know, we're really something. That, they used to drive my Pennsylvania father nuts and my <laughs> Illinois mother nuts that why don't we have a lot of pride in our history? Matter of fact, when I was governor, I insisted we put these signs as you drive up by a city, you know, see Enid and all the things in Enid. Right. Because a lot of people, what's the history of that place? Right. Okima, what's the history of that place? And I think a combination of what we saw of ourselves after the Oklahoma City tragedy, the excellence of the response, the love and the character of the people, and, you know, maps in Oklahoma City, the thunder has transformed sure. the state. But you add all these things together, and like for my kids, you know, who are Oklahomans by birth but grew up back east, they wouldn't live anyplace else. So what's the argument again? When I was a kid, everybody said, when are you, where are you going when you graduate from college? <laughs> right. I mean, that was a very different culture, and I think Oak City uh, bombing and the Oklahoma standard did transform the state. Well, I'm a Perry, Oklahoma graduate. I'm a proud Perry Maroon. And uh, so I'm, I'm definitely Oklahoma through and through. And I always appreciate the Oklahoma standard, but I also was prideful that when I flew to the East or West Coast, that I was going to be an am ambassador for Oklahoma because I was mm -hmm. really proud of the state where I was coming, coming from and always enjoyed to be able to tell people about Oklahoma that, yes, we did have running water yeah. and stuff like that, <laughs> but we have a lot more than that. My special guest today is, as you can tell, Governor Frank Keating here on City Connections. And on the background, as you can see, is the cover of uh, his children's book, One of Many, uh, with Will Rogers. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. In your second term, Governor, it seemed like uh, you, you may have turned more of a focus on education. And in my research, I saw that you, in your inaugural address, you uh, had 
specific educational goals for Oklahoma. So my question to you is why why was education a big deal for you at that time? And well, not to say that it wasn't earlier, but at that time. Well, one of the smart things I did, and I'm not real smart, but I'm reasonably intuitive. But this is one of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had the OU and OSU economics departments examine why are we poor? We were 45th in per capita income. When I left office with oil never above $18 a barrel, yeah. we were 38th in per capita income. Why is that? Well, because OU and OSU said, um, you don't have right to work, you got welfare, the trial bar runs this place, uh, the transportation infrastructure sucks, uh, you have too much divorce, and the kids don't take hard enough courses in school. <clears throat> so I sat down with a Democrat Speaker of the House, Democrat um, pro tem of the Senate, and I said, here's the agenda. We got to get this stuff done. So we made the kids take three years of math, science, and four years of science, history, and English. We finished all the turnpikes to that point, you know, the mm -hmm. Kilpatrick and the Creek. We got rid of welfare, we trimmed the uh, sales of the trial bar, and we sent to a vote of the people right to work. Um, now, as far as I'm concerned, the centerpiece of all that had to be education. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of it got watered down after I left office, which is terribly disappointing. You cannot um, provide the next generation of leaders in the state if they are poorly, badly educated. Right. You have to have people ready for the workforce. And I think the debate needs to be joined, charter school, public school choice, private, we got all that done, but not private school choice, and much heavier, rigorous academics for young people. A city like Enda does a much better job. Some parts of our state don't do a very effective job at all. And I think that that's something that needs to be focused on. But I'm really proud of the fact that we did zero in on education, but unfortunately, a lot of that momentum was lost. Um, rigor is hugely important. That's all that matters, in my opinion, and that's something that we, I think many times we think it's more important for the kid to be happy than to be well-educated, and that's certainly disappointing. Yeah. Well, let's talk about maybe an aspect of the, the governor's life that you may not be familiar with. Uh, it's my understanding he's on book number five, maybe, maybe more. We'll find out in a moment. But in 2002, Governor Frank Keating had authored a children's book. You see the cover behind us with Will Rogers, another book about Theodore Roosevelt, and then a, a book on the trial of Standing Bear, and then George Washington. And did you say you have an Abraham Lincoln yes. book coming mm -hmm. up? Right. So where was your inspiration or what was your inspiration to start writing all these children's books? Well, Is that the I, educator part well, in you coming out? Well, no, no, <laughs> but, but um, when I was governor, <clears throat> Kathy, my wife, insisted that we have an Oklahoma artist paint all the state Christmas cards that we would send out. So one year we chose Mike Wimmer to be the artist and I would ask, can I buy the original painting because I want to save it. And everybody said, well, yeah, $300, or maybe one was 500 bucks. One guy donated the art. Well, Wimmer had this spectacular painting in the mansion of Santa Claus putting <laughs> uh, toys in a stocking in the, in the mansion sure. the library. So <clears throat> when it, finally it was in the, the Christmas card, I said, hey, Mike, by the way, I want to buy that painting if I can. And he said, happy to. I'll, uh, I said, well, how much is it? I figured I was making you know, a pretty modest amount of money. He said it was $6,000. I went, $6,000. So I said, can you put me on the easy payment plan? <laughs> you know, lay away and for I life. paid him, no lie, I paid him $500 <laughs> a month until it was paid for. Wow. When he brought the painting, the spectacular painting, uh, to me, and I now I paid for it so I could own it, uh, he said, oh, by the way, we need to find somebody who can author a child's book for Harcourt, one of the major publishers, mm -hmm. on Will Rogers. And I said, well, how about me? He said, have you ever done a children's book? I said, no. He said, well, why don't you research and write something up? Let's see what happens. So Will Rogers, behind us, came out. It was the best children's book of the year by the Western Writers of America. Then Simon & Schuster came to us, which is another major publishing house, said, we want to do the Mount Rushmore series for six to nine-year-olds. So we did George Warson, big seller. I was chairman of Mount Vernon's board, and, the, and we've sold uh, George. All the proceeds, by the way, go to the museums. We sold 50,000 copies wow. of George so far. That's great. Um, Theodore Roosevelt uh, also. Uh, Abraham Lincoln comes out this year. Simon & Schuster again. The last one will be, um, uh, will be uh, Thomas Jefferson. Then we did The Trial of Standing Bear, the story of Indian civil rights and the Ponca chief Standing Bear. And, of course, that's a real Oklahoma story. But all of them have been 
very successful. All of them have been award winners, and I'm really proud as kind of an avocation uh, to have fun with children's books. Well, I appreciate you taking time to do so. I, I love Oklahoma history, and many, many years ago, I found out that I was second cousin to Jim Thorpe. Oh, really? So I'm part of the Sack and Fox, Pottawatomie oh, yeah. tribe and all right. that. So that really got me interested in history right. and stuff like that. So. And the Thorpe story is extraordinary. Yeah. You know, a Native American who was the greatest athlete in the world yeah. at the time. And, and, you know, those kind of stories need to be celebrated. Yeah, absolutely. Well, special guest on City Connections, as you can tell, Governor Frank Keating. We're going to come back after the short break. We want to talk about the governor's connection to Enid uh, in the past and also today. Thanks for staying with us. We'll be right back. Again, thank you for staying with us on City Connections today. Our special guest, uh, Governor Frank Keating, Let's talk a little bit, if we, if we could, about your past connection to Enid. And I know Norman Lamb fits into that equation and, uh, of course, the current lieutenant governor. Uh, but if you would, um, Governor Keating, just kind of share with us your connection to Enid, even today's connection. Well, you know, of course, when I was running for governor, the only place they weren't searching Republicans out with their headlights on Saturday night was northern Oklahoma and Enid in particular. I mean, you felt... As a Republican in those days, weren't very many Republicans. You feel um, safe up here. <laughs> I feel I felt safe up here, but I, I gave a talk to a civic group here, and Norman Lamb was uh, the guy that in, introduced me and encouraged me to come. <clears throat> I felt that not a whole lot of folks knew who I was. Not a whole lot of folks would be supportive of me, but Norman said, "Well, I will be," and that's mm. a start. And I said, what? You're kidding me. I mean, that really, uh, somebody who was certainly in politics, he and I were in the state Senate together, to say, uh, okay, I don't know who yeah. these other guys will be, but I'm for you. And then later, not connected necessarily to Norman, is that Todd, his son, who's now our lieutenant governor, right. Todd was playing uh, football at Oklahoma State, took a leave of absence from OSU to be my driver. And I told him, I said, Todd, you can't do this. I mean, you've got to... <laughs> finish your education. He went to work for me, finished his education, went obviously in the Secret Service at my insistence to get a, a law enforcement credential and then uh, came back and went to law school. But I always thought the, the people in Eden were so warm and so wonderful. They highly educated workforce, very special people. Uh, Enid loves Oklahoma. Obviously Vance is mm -hmm. a big deal yeah. um, here. And um, just everybody I knew in Eden were very special people. And, you know, Lou Ward was uh, the, the king of the Republicans. Uh, Lou was stepped across the aisle, if you will, across the line and agreed to help me. And uh, it just went uphill from there or downhill from there, as the case may be. I, I mean, I really enjoy visiting the town, and I'm, I have many friends here. Well, I know the viewers here in Enid and Northwest Oklahoma enjoy watching these interviews because they, they get caught up. When we bring in special guests, they go, well, I wonder what they've been doing for the last X amount of years. So I appreciate you sharing that and your connection to Enid. I think you've had several achievements, but I think uh, people will remember the dome mm -hmm. and they'll remember the significance of that is about $22 million in private money. Right. And then, of course, the Guardian you know, statue right. on top of that, that's 12, 15 feet tall or something right. like that. Take us back to why was the dome important to Governor Frank Keating? Well, and, and you ask, what is your legacy to me? It's see, leading Oklahoma through the Oklahoma City tragedy, putting the dome in the Capitol and putting right to work in the Constitution, which were really significant and important things for Oklahoma. <clears throat> but to me, I was a young 28-year-old guy elected to the State House from Tulsa. And when I came over here, I remember North Lincoln was an absolute sludge pit. I mean, really <laughs> falling down uh, crime-infested neighborhoods and, and motels. It was really pretty miserable. There was the dome-less Capitol building that I described as a Bulgarian veterans hospital. <laughs> you know, inside the Capitol building. You want to say that again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, inside the Capitol building, there was no art. There was no yeah. history of Oklahoma. There was no bright tomorrow presented there, and nobody visited the place. 
So, you know, my feeling, and Charlie Ford, who was the state senator from Tulsa, helped in a big way to start the art collection for the Capitol building. Mike Wimmer, my artist for my books, mm -hmm. has a number of paintings in the Capitol. Now it's a major tourist attraction. But to put the dome on the Capitol, to celebrate Oklahoma history, culture, art, all the achievement of our state in that building is significant. You know, I insisted that we put the Oklahoma History Center across from the mansion, clean up that whole area, clean up North Lincoln. I remember one time I said to the then pro tem uh, of the Senate, I said, you know, just think when we'll come up Lincoln Boulevard, it'll be like the Champs Elysees in Paris. You'll see the dome of the Capitol, the History Center. And he said, what dome? And I said, no, wait, wait, just wait. It'll all be cool <laughs> <laughs> when we finish. Yeah. And I think it's it makes people proud of their state. Uh, sure. If you don't have pride, if you don't have history, you don't know anything, and you'll boogie, you know, when given half a chance. But we want the best and the brightest in Eden, America, and in Oklahoma to remain in the state, sure. to celebrate our state, and to enrich it. You've really provided us a history lesson today of your significant achievements and, and your heart's desire to see certain things take place. So as you reflect on being the governor of the state of Oklahoma two terms, um, what was the best thing about serving as governor? Well, it, it, to be able to, to stand up in front of a group of people and say, we need to go that direction and have people look that direction. Sure. You know, it, you can be a business leader, uh, you can be a legislator, but if you say the sun rises in the west out that window, um, most people will say, oh yeah, it, it <laughs> rises here. But if you're a mayor of a city, uh, or if you're a governor of a state, people want vision and they, or president of the United States, and they want suggestions as to how do we improve our lives? How do yeah. we better our lives? How do we get better employment, better education? And they look to the executive leadership to do that and to carve out eight years of your life as I did to be able to do that and contribute in some modest way to the success of the state is a glorious um, memory for me. Well, uh, we've got to the point of the interview for my, my closing question. And without prying too much, can you just tell the folks in Enid and Northwest Oklahoma what are you up to today? Without being too personal. Well, I'm still, you know? married, I'm still married to Kathy. And we've been married for, gosh, 44 years now. Okay. And she's glorious. I'm the chairman of the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., even though I live in Oklahoma City. That's the majority leaders of the Senate uh, of the U.S., uh, both parties. So I'm chairman of the board of that. And I've served on several of their commissions. Uh, I'm on uh, the Bank First Board in Oklahoma City. and. Uh, the Twilliger uh, Foundation, he was head of Trammell Crow Residential for affordable housing with Scott Brown and former senator from Massachusetts and, and um, um, uh, Henry Cisneros, former HUD secretary, and uh, several others who are very significant uh, government types in D.C. Um, but I'm on the Hall Capital Board in Oklahoma City as well and a senior partner of an international law firm, Holland & Knight. So I, you know, travel a lot. But so, I'm in Oklahoma City. As soon as we sell our house in D.C., we're going to buy a yeah. house in Oak City. We own a condo there. So in summary, he has no free time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, Governor, um, and I just want to thank everybody watching today. It's not everybody or not every day that a governor just drops things in Oklahoma City and comes to Enid to visit with us. And we certainly appreciate that. Uh, I know you're aware of what a challenge coin is all about. And I have a coin that I want to give you, Governor Keating. It says boundless, vibrant, original. Those are three key words that we associate with Enid. And that's our new logo, Enid, Oklahoma. But uh, I'm sure you have many items like this. Oh, but I wanted to thank present you. that to you. Yeah. And thank you for um, being here today. Do I have I'm, to do 50 push-ups? No, I mean, driving all the way up <laughs> to Oklahoma City, you got to get a coin. Yeah. And I, and I know you. you're a sharp dresser. You're a sharp dresser, that's for sure. And um, we've got a oh, pair wow. of cuff links. Uh, with the Enid logo on it. And when I looked at those so the other nice. day, I said, Governor Keating needs to take those home with him. So you well, got the coin, you got the uh, cuff that. links, and that's our way of saying thanks for being here. And let me shake your hand one now, more now time. Now, is that a visa so I can come back? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because <laughs> okay. we're, we're always telling our guests, come back and give us an update on what you are working on and stuff. So again, Great. Governor, it's been a real honor. It's been a privilege and I appreciate what you've done. And by the way, um, we kind of had a side conversation that uh, there was this proclamation of Steve Keim Day back on April 5th, 2001, and this guy right here signed that. 
I don't know if he remembers signing it, but I've got this big proclamation at home, and uh, I finally got to meet the guy who signed that. So. And it was well-deserved. <laughs> that's yeah. another story yeah. you probably heard. I only had to run 397 yeah, no, miles to do that. Incredible story. Governor, we've got to go. Thanks, Steve. Uh, blessings to you. I wish you the best, and do come back to Thank see you. us in Enid. We'll do it. And thank you for joining us on City Connections. Like I said, the guests keep getting better, but we certainly appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next week on City Connections. Until that time, I'm Steve Kine. Make it a great day.